next I'd like to uh, introduce Professor Hodge. She will come up and open the program. So please um, welcome Professor Hodge. event. I'm happy, very pleased to sponsor this for my department, the Africana African American Studies Department. And I'm especially pleased that Professor Menu Ampim is doing this type of work. And because of his knowledge and his expertise in this work, I have hired him to teach a class in my class in my department. Of course I that's in quotes. Professor <laughs> Ampim knows that <laughs> I do stuff like that. But anyway, um, it's, uh, he teaches History 110, which is African Civilization. And it's a class that I normally teach, but when he came on board, his expertise in, in this field of study is just amazing. So I asked him if he would just totally take off over the class and teach it, because he definitely is the expert. And I support his work, of course, his primary research in particular, because those of you who are not sure what primary research is, you have to go to the sites for any kind of evidence of anything that you're studying. It's not just reading and researching like we do here, go to the library, pull out some books, or go to the internet, whatever. You go right to the site for this uh, evidence. And this is what he's been doing for over 20 years. Before the Save Nubia project, he's been uh, doing a lot of work with Kemet, or as you know, as Egypt. Uh, for 12, 13, 14 years, he goes to that area, documents what's going on to protect the fact that the, the artifacts there, the buildings, the temples, the structures that are built by Africans, indigenous Africans, uh, that history and culture continues. And it's important because there is a movement to try to hide that. So, and of course, you will learn that in his class if you take that History 110 class. So again, I am very happy that this event is happening. I'm so glad that he, he started this project uh, in 2012 to draw attention to what's going on in, in the Sudan and in the surrounding areas. So please enjoy the rest of the program and keep in mind that this is something ongoing and that you need to know about and tell others about this because you're not gonna get this on the five o'clock news. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. I want to thank you all for coming out. Give yourself a big hand. You're very beautiful. If you haven't had a chance to turn to the person sitting to the left or the right of you, you should and acknowledge them and thank them for coming out and spending the time. Because this type of time, you can't get back, but this is the type of time of real substance. We're so happy to have you all come out here and fill up this uh, auditorium for the professor, for this event, and for the people over in Nubia. This is a very serious, serious crisis. We're very glad to have you here on this crusade. As we're getting started with this beautiful program, we have to make sure that everybody understands that this is a crusade for humanity. We appreciate all of those who come before us and all of those who are coming behind us. We'd like to thank Rose. African Church. We'd like to thank the community of San Pablo City, Richmond, the Bay Area. We'd like to thank the East Bay Express, the Examiner. We'd like to thank all of the faculty, men, uh, faculty members, all of the academians. We'd like to thank all of you who've come out to support, all the senior citizens who've taken the time to come out here. Those of you who love to play basketball like myself. Normally I'm on the court torturing folks, but I found something better to come out here and do. So I'm very glad to be here. Professor Menu's mom is here with us, somewhere yeah. back here. So we want to thank that sister. Yeah. Want to thank the staff for coming out here. Beautiful staff. Uh, we volunteer. We put in a lot of work. And for those who don't know, it is not easy. This is not easy. And Professor Menu demands high standards. <laughs> high standards. This man is not a joke. Mm -hmm. This is not game goofy. This is not monopoly. This is the real thing. And you would know it because he's nice, as long as you're in line. <laughs> <laughs> but Professor Manu is a um, wonderful human being. Uh, the crisis in the uh, uh, 
his abilities to pull, pull this crisis together, pull this crusade. He's a master of art out of Morgan State University with history, African studies. Uh, he's collaborated on projects with NASA with regards to migration patterns, uh, ancient uh, climates. Uh, Professor uh, Manu has worked in the country and around the country, going to numerous museums, studying the different artifacts. Like the sister said earlier, Ms. Carol Hodge, about Professor Hodge, when she mentioned about him going to do primary research, he goes there and do the research. He don't just read and just say, I'm a professor. He goes and do the research, primary research. I was with Professor Manu in a clinic, mistakenly called Egypt. And uh, I was happy to be with him. I mean, I, I'm the first African-American probably to say I went with him back to back. And uh, I was in some really nice Italian poetry and didn't know what I was getting into when the professor said, brother, you want to come out in the field with me? Mm -hmm. Oh, bad. Because I'm over in Kelly, dressed like Fred Williamson, getting ready to make a set with Jim Brown and Jim Kelly. And so I'm, I'm, I'm smoking. I'm just looking good. And so me and the professor go on this journey, and uh, I'm sweating hard. <laughs> I mean, I'm really sweating like I'm in a steam room. And I'm like, man, he's telling me, he's like, brother, you okay? And I swam like a mile back. <laughs> and he's, he's sliding through the sand, I mean, with no, with no effort, just <laughs> moving. And I'm like, man, what is this dude doing? Trying to kill me out here or what? <laughs> well, we found an area that very few people find. It was the pyramid area where the pyramid builders stay and where the people who lived there. So there was no slaves who built the pyramids. You can forget all that. And you can forget all those kind of lies. This brother took me to that area over there. And he was crawling down in the tombs, talking about, brother, I'm going to read these inscriptions down here. Just hold this. And I'm looking, they got guards all over the place, but they sleep. And professing me, we're creeping, you know. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, some, some dog, like, like, like a bat out of hell, came out of nowhere. And professor was down there. And all of a sudden, he passed me. He said, come on. And, and I'm like, for what? And we seen this huge dog coming at us. And I'm just like, he was down there, and now he's way up here. <laughs> I, I don't understand, you know. But um, we're very glad to have you come out here. This is a very um, moving time and moving experience. And I don't want to take up too much of your time, but Professor Manu has been working on this project um, way since uh, 2012 or February. Uh, this has been going on in his mind because he goes over into the Sudan, over in different areas, uh, the, the region over there in the northern and central Sudan. So he's been looking at work that has not been done. And it's good to see the multicultural family in here because no matter where you born or where you at, your organs are African organs. Your heart and blood pumps from Africa. So with that being said, we know that we got these dams being built and that type of electricity that will be used for industries and held by corporations. Not always good for the people that's in that area. Brothers and sisters, there's no need to hold up this uh, time. I'm going to bring to you the man of the hour, Tower of Power, a very, very special man who's taken on the crusade of humanity. His name is Professor Manu Ampim. Let's join him. Good, good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Okay, uh, nice to see you all this afternoon to come out and, and hear what we have to say about, about uh, the classical African civilization of Nubia. And I started this work about uh, a quarter century ago of doing uh, first-hand or primary research. And at the time, I had really no idea where it would lead, but over time, I noticed that around the country and or actually around the world in the 19 countries that I've actually traveled to, there's, there's, uh, there's been one interested person after another who has been uh, uh, very instrumental in helping me to do the work. So over the years, the work has snowballed into a, a, uh, a really a global campaign. Uh, you have no idea how many phone calls and emails that we receive re regarding this event where people were interested in a webinar because they're not here in the Bay Area so that they can get the first-hand, up-to-date information about uh, classical Africa, particularly Nubia. So I want to thank you all for, for coming out. And I have the opportunity to share with you the, uh, the fruits of my field work just last year, 
So I'm going to give you an overview of really why Nubia is significant, why it's important. And you know, people hear about Nubia, they uh, talk about Nubian kings or Nubian queens, but I want to share with you the details of that. And we had a seminar some months ago on the historical significance of Kush. And when I say that, a lot of young people said, he's talking about Kush, they, they think we're talking about marijuana and dope smoking. No, we're not talking about that. We're talking about the ancient civilization of Kush. So that's what we're going to focus on today, the second of these classical African civilizations of, of Nubia. And uh, so obviously we're talking about Africa. And um, it's important, as, uh, as my colleagues has mentioned, that Egypt is one of these classical African civilizations. The correct name is actually uh, Kemet. So that's a third oldest of these, uh, of these classical African uh, civilizations, but today we focus on the second one. So I'm going to share with you why Nubia is important and uh, what's at stake, because that's why we're really here. So the order in which these African civilizations emerge are first Kush, and then Nubia, and then Kemet. And the Greeks changed the name Kemet to, to Egypt. So this is a vast study. I mean, we can spend literally years and never really scratch the surface because there are dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of archaeological sites that are up and down the Northeast African corridor in current day Sudan, current day Egypt, parts of Ethiopia. Then there are collections around the world that have uh, artifacts in museums, institutes, libraries. So this is why I've traveled to around, uh, around the world. So we call these classical African civilizations because classical is more important than just saying ancient. We hear about classical what? Classical dance, classical theater, classical music, classical what else? Okay, and so what does classical mean? Because we hear the term, the standard. What else? The model, the guide, the prototype. And classical means anything that has permanent and lasting value. That's why we call these classical African civilizations. It's more important to call it classical and not simply ancient. And so my colleague, Professor Hodge, mentioned uh, the, uh, the Africana Studies Department. And do you know that in all of Northern California, from Sacramento to San Jose and beyond, the History 110 course on African civilization, this is the only course that's taught as a requirement in any community college in the entire region on classical Africa. Most community colleges have no class on African civilizations. They don't have one. And the few that do, it's an optional course. So we've made it a requirement here. And the only other course of its type that is taught anywhere in this vast region is the one that I teach at Merritt. And it's because I created the class, even though I'm full time here, I created it. So these are the only two classes that someone can really learn about this at the community college level. So anyway, this is why we call these classical African civilizations, because they re reach the apex of human achievement. We're not just using terms, but this is the, the, the best of the best. It's what humanity drew from. And that these civilizations have been either dismissed, ignored, omitted, or have been uh, detached from Africa in some way. So I want to share with you. Uh, what I was doing in Sudan a year ago, and I'm going to go back to do more uh, research, which is important. So in terms of the origins of uh, Nubia, it emerges as a powerful kingdom about 3400 before the Common Era. And so that's about uh, 5400 years ago that it emerged in its full state with a, uh, an elaborate kingship. And we see this as a, uh, a crucial development in the Northeast African corridor. And so uh, the location of Nubia, Nubia is not a country, it's an area in southern Egypt and northern Sudan, and that's where the Nubians are today. They're in that, in that region. So that's why I go to the area. But one thing that makes Nubia crucial and important is the first clear evidence of a pharaonic state. We hear about pharaohs, but a state organized under a king. They call them a per'ah. Per'ah simply means great house. Like we hear about the White House, they said the per'ah or great house, and that was changed by the Greeks to the word pharaoh. But the first image of a, of a, of a per'ah, we see that emerging in, uh, in the Nubian region. It's the first clear evidence. We also see clear evidence of the Medunetra inscription. And I use the original names because, as Brother Malik mentioned, as I read the Medunetra or so-called hieroglyphs, there's no reason really 
to mention the foreign names that the, the Greeks later called the terms because we can read the original. And so, uh, and also the, the culture of Nubians today gives us great insight about the classical Nubian civilization of the past. You look at their cultural norms, their moral ways, their ways of life, or their life ways, you can see that they come from a high level civilization. People are stunned when they see the high level development of modern day Nubians. They may not have a lot of material resources, but uh, their character and the way they organize their culture is absolutely stunning. But that's why we go to the region to learn about Nubia because of, of uh, these things here, because they re represent a firm foundation in, in the class classical African tradition. And by the way, I have to explain these things because if we were talking about Greece or Rome, it would be unnecessary. People assume the value of Greece and Rome. Is that not correct? Yes, so, but we have to explain this because this is pretty much uh, new information. And there's very few people in the world that have this information. So there's very few Nubiologists who specialize in the study of ancient Nubia. And there's, very few, there's even fewer people who know about ancient Kush, which we call Kushology. People hear about Egyptology, but what about Nubiology and even more importantly, Kushology? These are emerging fields. So you have people who have really misled the public about these cultures. And so I, uh, when I was an undergraduate student, I followed the tradition and the guidelines of the great primary researcher, Dr. Chancellor Williams, who wrote The Destruction of Black Civilization. He indicated one of the great stories, how did Africans go from building pyramids to living in projects and slums? He, he, he chronicles the whole story. But what makes Chancellor Williams important is he lays out step by step what younger historians should do. And so he was a pioneer, uh, to say the least. And one of the things that caught my attention is Chancellor Williams, he put together this map of the so-called Ethiopian Empire. By the way, the word Ethiopia is a Greek word. It means black face, uh, burnt face, or kissed by the sun. That's what Ethiopia means because the Greeks were stunned by the skin tone, the skin color of the Africans. Uh, in Northeast Africa, and, uh, but they changed the name Kush to, uh, 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 to Ethiopia. That's where the term comes from. So when you see the Ethiopian Empire, Chancellor Williams really means the Kushite Empire. And what's interesting here is that this, this researcher did research among 26 countries in Africa and, uh, and did research among, 100, among 105 different language groups. He was a researcher's researcher. He did this work in the 1950s and he put together a very important map because if you notice here, he understood, Chancellor Williams did, that Nubia is the southern part of the Ethiopian or Kushite Empire, then Kim or Kemet is a northern part. So he properly understood this is a vast region uh, where Nubia and Kemet, or so-called Egypt, that they related to the much older mother culture of Kush. And so this is what inspired me when I read the destruction of black civilization, but also took a look at his map. And so here's one of the things that Chancellor Williams said. He said, I regard direct investigation in the field and in Africa as the highest importance. I was inspired by this. I've done work in many different fields, many different subjects, but one of them, one of the subjects that caught my attention was to look at Africa because I remember when I was growing up in middle school and high school, we didn't learn anything. In fact, we didn't even learn anything in college. I didn't. And so I was stunned that I would go and, and, and matriculate at a historically black college and learn none of this. And when I asked my professor about it, she, she, was, she, she felt offended that I asked that, that we learn a little bit more about Africa. Anyway, notice what Chancellor Williams says. He says, so vast and untapped is the real history of the African race that I myself only scratched the surface of what, of, of what is yet to be done. Some of the areas to be explored by future historians are set forth in pages which follow in this chapter. So when I read this, I didn't see it as an abstract text. I actually took his work personal. So, I, so what I did, I replaced future historians with my name, Abbe New M. Pym, because I thought that Dr. Williams was talking to me uh, when he said that future historians would explore uh, the area. And you never know where your life's mission would take you. But uh, for me, it was really to follow in his uh, footsteps. But notice he also mentions that there's a great tragedy that has occurred, that's the loss of the civilizations. And I didn't want to be someone who talked about it, complained about it, but didn't do anything about it. So I've been 
on the case for the last couple decades uh, looking to recover the history. Let me show you how Nubia is very much misunderstood by mainstream Egyptologists because they really don't know. For example, this is a book that people often refer to, Ancient Nubia, by David O'Connor. And this is a classic example that people are very confused. We're talking about people who are at the pinnacle of their field, and yet they don't know about, uh, that much about classical Africa. So take a look at, at David O'Connor's statement. He said, Nubia and Nubians for the periods covered in this book refer only to the geographical locations, not to the ethnicity or language of the people involved. Nubia is a word of uncertain origin, un uncertain for him. And he also goes on to admit that uh, often the people or place involved is obscure to us. Who's he talking about? He's talking about mainstream. It's obscure to them. They didn't read Chancellor Williams. They didn't read Drusilla Dunja Houston or John G. Jackson or other authors who've written about the, this whole area. And he also is clear that he's unclear. So he says, are the people named the entire Nubian nation or those of a subregion or even a small village? We don't know. Is the place all Nubia part of it or a single site? and which are located in which place? These questions can puzzle scholars. He means mainstream scholars. He's not talking about Chancellor Williams because they don't read people outside of the mainstream. So let me help O'Connor out and clarify some of these things today. In fact, you might find this, this map online somewhere just to give you an idea that this map has little to do with the historical location of Nubia. I mean, yes, it is in Northeast Africa. You can see the smaller map here. But this whole area has never been all of Nubia. Nubia is in the area where you can see Aswan, so southern Egypt and northern Sudan. Nubia never went further south than this area here. But because the mainstream writers and Egyptologists don't know, they just use a generic term in order to cover up for the fact that they don't know. And they make up uh, maps that really have little to do with, with facts. And then uh, they take this further, the mainstream. I'm just showing you this in order to indicate the context of the work that I've done to clarify these questions that, that a lot of the people don't know. Now, here you have a uh, National Geographic, February 2008, the Black Pharaohs. That's redundant. Why do you call them the black pharaohs? That's like saying the wet rain. We know by nature the rain is wet. That's like somebody talking about the Sahara Desert. Why would you repeat? What does Sahara mean in Arabic? It means desert. So why is somebody repeating black pharaohs? No one talks about the uh, white emperors of Rome. Have you ever heard that term? No, it's, it's assumed, is it not? So uh, these people have uh, tried to make it seem like only some of the pharaohs were, were black, and that's the 25th dynasty in the late age. But let me introduce you to Robert Moorcock. This is someone that I had a chance to spend some time with when I lived in London in 1989 and 90. Robert Moorcock, he, uh, he popularized the term the black pharaohs. He may not have coined it, but he certainly popularized it with his book. And then he makes a cardinal mistake. He says, Egypt's Nubian rulers. This is an image of the great Taharqa. Taharqa is the greatest builder among the people of Kush. Everywhere you look in the Nile Valley, Taharqa is building pyramids, building elaborate temples, building great structures that confound the world. When visitors see the work of Taharqa, they're impressed. He's the greatest of all of the Kushite builders, going back into uh, about almost 3,000 years ago. And yet Robert Morcott is not aware that this is an image of a Kush ruler and he's not Nubian because they mix and mingle these cultures because they don't know. They just uh, use generic terms and these are the people that have defined the discipline, they shape the discipline, they, they dominate thinking in the field. So if they can't get maps straight and, and simple statues straight, you know they can't get the history straight. So here's Morcock, he's very happy, he's selling his, uh, his book here. <laughs> and. Uh, all right, so anyway, let me help him out here. This, all of this is not Nubia. This is where Nubia really is. N Nubia does not extend south. And if people did the field work, they would know that modern day Nubia and ancient Nubia is pretty much in the same area. You never find Nubians uh, further south than this area here. But they don't know, so they just call everybody Nubians in order to get past a problem. And that is they don't know the culture very well. So this is a map that I created for our Save Nubia project. And uh, it's a map of uh, where Nubia, here's the Nile River. It's the longest river in the world. Actually, it's flowing from south to north because it's flowing downhill. 
And so this is areas Nubia, and these are areas where there are, are dams that are, some are completed, others are projected. But this area is where Nubia really is. It never extended south, as you saw in the previous map. And uh, one of the things that's interesting about the whole complex, the whole corridor from Egypt and Sudan, that whole region dealing with Kush and Nubia and Kemet, is that you can't tell the difference from the, the, the pottery. The black top pottery you might find in, in, uh, among the Kushites or Nubians or people in Kemet, it's almost the same. It's, it's virtually identical. One of the things that separates cultures is pottery. And, and language and things like that, but you can't tell the pottery, really, the difference, because it's one common cultural complex. So the black top pottery, you see it everywhere, which indicates it's one vast uh, civilization complex that originated initially from Kush and then, and then Nubia. Look at the, 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 the intimacy with nature. Here you have a Nubian soldier. You see he's got the, the bow in his hand. You, you see him here. Here's some of the metal nature inscription. The soldiers, the highest honor on the battlefield was to receive a fly pendant. Now most people see a fly as nothing more than what? A pest. So if a fly or a bee flew in, people, the, half the audience scatters this way, the other half scatters that way. They see it as nothing more than a pest, but in this culture, totally different. They saw the fly as absolutely important. So to receive uh, an honor for being uh, courageous on the battlefield, they would receive a fly pendant. And not only that, but what did they associate the kings with? I'm glad you asked. They associated the kings with the bee. Think about that. A bee associated with kingship and the fly given at the, as the highest honor for someone, or one of the highest honors for someone who is, is uh, a, a soldier on the battlefield. That's how close they were to nature, and we learned a lot about the culture, uh, to say the least. You have uh, important images like Queen Depu. These are people that came from the south. They go from south to north. Look at the beautiful art. Look at the almond-shaped eyes. Look at the, the, uh, the, the beautiful jewelry, the necklace. Look at the bracelets. And uh, is this not beautiful? Look at the linen, the linen outfit here. The artists were at their best 